In this video, we will be covering the pseudocode statements that you need to know for the IGCSE computer science exam. This video is actually the second video of a two-part series. So in this video, we will be covering these topics. But if you would like to revise these ones, please check out my other video, which I will link in the description. So let's get into it. To declare a 1D array, you have to write it in this format, indicating the lower bound and upper bounds of the array's indexes and the data type that the array will be holding. For example, if you want to store the names of 10 students in an array, you have to declare the lower bound as 1 and the upper bound as 10, and that the data type to be stored is the string data type. To populate the array, you have to state the index that you want to access in square brackets, and then assign a value to be stored using a left arrow. So for example, if I want my first element in my array to be the name Ethan, I have to put the number 1 in these square brackets, and then you know the value I want to store and this left arrow. So yeah, you just do the same for the rest of the indexes. You can also update the index of an array by overriding it with a new value like this. So initially in index 7, we had name James, but if you want to replace it with John, we just like redo the assignment statement later on in the program, and this will cause the array to be updated. 2D arrays work in a similar way as 1D arrays, except that they have two dimensions. The first dimension indicates the number of rows, and the second dimension indicates the number of columns. So for example, if you want to create a 3x3 grid for a tic-tac-toe game, this can be accomplished with a 2D array with 3 rows and 3 columns. To access the 2D array, you have to reference both the row and column index numbers as shown here. Now onto string operations. Firstly, we have the L case and U case operations. So these are pretty straightforward. The L case operation returns a string with all characters in lowercase, and the U case operation returns a string with all characters in uppercase. L case Taylor Swift returns Taylor Swift in all lowercase, while U case Taylor Swift returns the opposite. Next is the length operation, which calculates the length of a string. Taylor Swift, including the space character, has 12 characters, so the number 12 is returned. And finally, we have the substring operation, which has three components the identifier, the start position of your desired substring, and the length of the substring. For example, substring Taylor Swift 1, 6 returns Taylor. The start position is 1, so this refers to the first character, T, and the length is 6, meaning that we want the 6 characters starting from this start position. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 gives us Taylor, since these are the 6 characters. If we replace the start position with 8 and the length with 5, we will get Swift because um, S, this capital S, is the 8th character in the string. And if we want the 5 characters from the start position, we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So this returns Swift. Now onto round and random. The round operation returns a number rounded to a specified number of decimal places. For example, round 5.550, so 5.55 to 0 decimal places returns 6. And if you want to return it to one decimal place, you get 5.6, and so on and so forth. The random operation returns a random real number between 0 and 1 inclusive. For example, it could return 0 0.2374 or 0 0.9812, anything between 0 to 1. If you want to generate a random whole number, you could combine the two operations like this. So in this example, uh, this returns a whole number between 0 and 6. Now on to procedures. Here's the structure for defining and calling a procedure. A procedure is basically a reusable block of instructions that performs a specific task. The identifier of the procedure can be called again and again, and every time you call it, the statements in the procedure will be executed. For example, let's say we have a procedure called display menu. The purpose of this procedure is to output these four statements, right? So every time you want to do this in your program, you can simply call the procedure and the statements inside the procedure will be executed. So rather than writing the statements again and again and again, you can save time by just creating a procedure and then calling it whenever it is necessary. Here is the syntax for a procedure with parameters, which are basically variables that pass information into the procedure. A procedure might need parameters so that it can work with different values each time it is called. This makes the procedure more flexible and reusable since the same code can handle many situations. So here's an example of a procedure called calculate grade and it has a parameter named score 
that holds an integer value. So in this case, 72 and 59 are arguments that you're passing into the parameter name score. So that the procedure can use these specific values during its execution. For example, 72 will be passed into score and it is stored in this variable score so that whenever score appears in the procedure, like it already knows what value to use. So what's the difference between a procedure with parameters and without parameters? A procedure with parameters is adaptable to different situations and data every time that it runs. As you can see, the results of the statements here will be different every time you call the procedure with different values. However, a procedure without parameters always performs the same set of instructions since it has no way to receive outside input. Next, let's look at functions, which is like a procedure in that it also performs a specific task, but it always returns a value to the part of the program that called it. Something to note is that you cannot use the call keyword for functions. Functions should only be called as part of an expression. Here's a very simplified example. Here the function is named getPi and it returns this value. Let's say that we want to calculate the area of a circle. When we execute getPi here in this statement, the value like inside of this function's return statement will be returned and used in this calculation directly. So basically when a statement with a function is being executed, what happens is that it will go to the section with the corresponding function and obtain the return value and like return it directly into this statement so that it can be used. Here is another example, this time using a function with parameters. So down here, the program was to find the square of the number 5. So this number is passed into the function's parameter. The user's input is then squared and returned and is directly assigned to this variable final answer. So yeah, the difference between functions and procedures is that functions are typically used when you need a result while procedures are used when you need an operation done. On to file handling operations. Every time you open a file, you have to state the name of the file and whether you want it to be in read or write mode. Once you are finished, the file must be closed using the close file command. Files are read line by line. To read from a file, use the read file operation. So what this does is that it reads one line from the file and stores this line into the variable of your choosing. If you use the read line command for the first time, it will read the first line of the file. And if you use it again, it will read the next line and so on until you close the file. To write to a file, you should use the write file operation, which places the contents of a variable into the file. Be aware that if the file you specified existingly contained data, it will be completely overwritten with the contents of this variable. So I guess you could think of this operation more as an overwrite file operation. Here's an example of some pseudocode that copies a line of text from file A to file B. Firstly, the line of text variable is declared as a string to be used later on. File A and file B are then opened in read and write mode respectively. Next, the first line in file A is read and then stored in the line of text variable. And then now what is currently inside of this line of text variable is written into file B. File A still has that line inside of it by the way. So now that file B has this line of text from file A, we've accomplished what we wanted to do. So now both files are closed. If you want to read all the lines in file A and copy them to file B, you would have to use a loop, so something like this. So what we do is that we declare the line of text variable, open file A and file B, and then we set a while loop to have this condition, while not EOF file A. So EOF means end of file, and these statements here will be continuously executed until the end of file A has been reached, at which point the loop will terminate and both the files are closed. Finally, if you just want to write a comment for yourself or for another reader, just use two forward slashes followed by your comment. Everything after the slashes is interpreted to be a comment until the next line. So that's it for this revision guide on pseudocode statements. Please leave any questions that you have in the comments, and thank you so much for watching.